This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Chapter 10 deals with ordered evidence. What is ordered evidence? How can we collect it? What do we need it for? So we go back to this uh, overview of unordered. Uh, we have in the last chapter looked at risk and we know that we have to respond to risk. We have to, as auditors, vary the detection risk uh, in line with the inherent risk or control risk so that at the end of the day, the ordered risk, the risk of giving an inappropriate opinion, is low. We are collecting evidence uh, which is essentially to, to, to do with the detection risk. The more evidence you collect, then the less chance that a material misstatement finds its way through into the published financial statements. There are two approaches to the audit, as we've said. We can either go down here the left-hand route, which is going to be mainly uh, uh, relying on the client's internal controls and the client will prevent or detect and correct any errors which have been made. In other words, there's a very low control risk. Or we can go down the right, uh, where we ourselves have to do a lot of almost direct work, what's called substantive work ourselves, to, to verify the balances. Whichever route we're doing, we need evidence. If we're going down the left-hand route, we need evidence that the controls are uh, effective and that they are operating consistently during the year. If we're going down the right-hand route, we need evidence, direct evidence, that the figures in the financial statements are, if you like, true and fair. I mean, I, I use the word correct. I use the word okay as a kind of uh, colloquialism, but, but, but don't include any material misstatements. So both routes require evidence. So what is meant by evidence? What are the, the, the types of evidence? How much evidence do we need? Are there different qualities, different kind of reliabilities of evidence? So uh, let's uh, we go on to the uh, next uh, slide uh, here. First of all, uh, we need sufficient appropriate ordered evidence to be able to draw reasonable conclusions. Sufficient, appropriate. And we may have mentioned uh, before what those words mean. Sufficient is really a, a, a quantity of evidence, that we have collected enough evidence. We have looked maybe at enough invoices, we have looked at enough uh, uh, pay slips, we have looked at enough uh, sales invoices, or looked at enough overtime claims, or looked at, a lot, at, at enough purchase invoices to make sure they've been uh, 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 posted to the right accounts in the normal ledger and so on, we have looked at enough of these to satisfy ourselves that, you know, the chances of a, a, a material misstatement are pretty low. Or we have looked at enough operations of controls. We have looked at enough signatures and invoices to see, yes, that invoice accountant over there is doing the job correctly, is uh, looking at what the invoice is, is signing it off as having been properly ordered and the goods received. So the evidence, I, I, I say again, can either be about the controls being an operation or there can be this more direct kind of substantive evidence that the document itself is correct or the balance itself is correct. And it has to be appropriate. It has to be uh, reliable. It has to be evidence worth having, if you like. And it has to be evidence which is actually going to support what we want it to support. So, for example, in the UK, uh, all our cars, they have what's called a registration document. Uh, and this, this information is held by government, by the police and so on, uh, so they can detect speeding cars, stolen cars and, and, and the like. Now, strictly speaking, what the... Uh, registration document shows is the registered keeper of the car. In other words, it's the, the person who's likely to be driving it, who's kind of responsible for it. It doesn't prove who owns it. So, so if you were looking at uh, one of these registration documents in the UK, 
uh, it uh, a company may have registered it potentially with an employee because that's a registered keeper but it may be the company who owns it or the company may have registered it in its own name but the company doesn't actually own it because the car is leased because the car is uh, not been bought outright it is leased nevertheless the government wants you to register who's kind of responsible for it so, so, so they're looking at the registration documents is not really providing relevant evidence as to the ownership of it. So what are the uh, types of uh, 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 almost order, pecking order that you would have for how good is evidence? And first of all, we, we have here external evidence is better than the entity's records. This is why it is great. Uh, you have the cash book, which is held by the entity, but you've got bank statements coming in. At the end of the year, you also get what's called a bank certificate sent by the bank directly to the auditors, saying this is how much the client had in the bank. And, and getting this uh, third-party evidence is much stronger than, than just relying on the internal evidence. Why would this third-party mislead you, you know? So, uh, and also we'll see at uh, year end, it is very uh, common to write to your customers, asking them, do they owe, could you confirm that the client owes this amount of money? And the customer writes back and says, yes, I owe this person $10,000 or whatever the, uh, the debt is. This is fantastic third party independent evidence, better than simply looking at the receivables balance in the, the client's own receivables ledger. Secondly, uh, auditor uh, direct uh, uh, obtained is better than indirect evidence. Uh, so when I said there that we were uh, writing to uh, customers of the client, asking them to confirm how much they owed the client at the end of the year, we want those replies to come directly back to the auditor. Think what would happen if customers sent replies back to the client. The client would look at these replies and say, well, that one agrees. I'll give that one to the auditor. This one doesn't agree. I'll throw that one away and simply tell the auditor that this person didn't reply. So if you can get the evidence directly yourself, that, that's great. If you can see something directly yourself, uh, rather than asking somebody, does that machine work? Is, is it still being used? If you see it being work, see it working in the factory, then that is much stronger evidence than, than some sort of indirect evidence. Evidence or documentation or figures within the entity, within the client, are, are much more reliable if there's a good internal control system. What the internal control system will do is to prevent, detect and correct errors uh, and therefore when you, you, you look at figures in a company with a good internal control system there's, there's much more chance that they are correct. If it's a sloppy system that nobody really cares about you look at a figure uh, you have really no idea whether it's right. It could easily be wrong and no one would be any the wiser. Written is better than oral uh, if you ask uh, the uh, sales director, for example, do you think these, these items of stock in inventory are going to sell or will they have to be written down? Uh, this person could say, yes, I think they'll sell. They don't need to be written down. Uh, but it's, uh, how are you going to document that evidence? How are you going to maybe prove that that's what you were told? Uh, you might need at some stage to prove that you're being misled if something goes wrong with the audit. But if somebody has to kind of write you a letter saying, yes, I think these goods are going to be s s uh, sold at the proper selling price, they won't need to be written down, you can put that on the audit file, you've got a hard bit of evidence there, uh, which is far stronger. You can refer back to it, other people can... Uh, can, can work with it and see it and assess it. And if the worst comes to the worst and you're in a court of law because the audit has gone bad, you, you, can, you can wave this piece of evidence uh, in the court and say, look, they signed this here. This is what I've been relying on. And finally, originals are better than photocopies. Uh, nowadays, of course, you can scan in documents, you can Photoshop documents. We've all seen examples in the press of uh, very often done for for 
you know, humorous reasons where a different head has been photoshopped onto a body or, or something of that sort. And, and you know you barely see the join that this can be so skilled. So, so if somebody has scanned in a document, let's say it's a, a contract, scanned it in and gives you a copy, a, a printed out copy of the scanned document, that's of hardly any use at all. Uh, because the, the sophistication of uh, uh, the optical uh, uh, programs of photoshops and the like is so great that you can change signatures, you can change amounts, you can change terms, and no one will see the join. If you need to see a contract, you want to see the original, what you might want to do then is to take a photocopy of that original uh, and keep that as part of the, document, the, the ordered documentation. But don't be fobbed off with documents which aren't original. They are not worth the paper they're printed on. Now, what are the uh, sources of evidence that we can have? And there are only five sources or classes of evidence under the sun. We remember them here by the vowels, A, E, N, I, O, and U. Uh, analytical procedures I will come to later. Uh, at the moment, I will say it's, it's basically looking at kind of ratios, but we'll, we have to get into that a lot more detail later on. Inquiry and confirmation. A source of evidence, you inquire of management. You ask management, do you think any of these receivables needs to be written off? Uh, do you think any of the inventory needs to be written down? It's not very good evidence. It's not very good evidence because it, it may be oral evidence, and of course it is uh, completely within the, the, the it's not third party evidence and, and, and so on. Uh, and you could almost reduce it to an absurd level. You ask management, uh, do the financial statement show a true and fair view? And obviously you're not going to simply accept that. Uh, but, but nevertheless, in, inquiry has a place. It's weak evidence, but, but sometimes you, we'll talk about much later on something called a letter of representation. This is where you get management to write a letter to you, the auditor, saying things like uh, the receivables have been fairly valued, the inventory has been fairly valued, we're not intending to close down uh, any of the uh, premises, shops, factories, we, there's been no fraud in the business that we are aware of and so on. You get them to sign that letter, now at least it's written, and the very act of signing a piece of paper, making certain claims, maybe focuses people's attention. Confirmation is where you go outside the business normally, writing to the bank, saying how much money did the client have then? Uh, writing to uh, customers saying how much money did you owe then and, th and the like. Confirmation, third party confirmation, especially if it's written, can be a very powerful source of evidence. Inspection. Uh, you can inspect documents, exp uh, you can uh, inspect uh, contracts, you could inspect uh, uh, the amounts of money received after the year end. So if you had an amount owing at year end of 12,000 from a client, uh, from, from a, 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 a client's customer, uh, you wanted to know, is that 12,000 actually going to be received? And then maybe halfway through January, you're inspecting the cash book and you see, oh, that 12,000 has come in. Then you have got great evidence that that uh, amount, that invoice is actually going to be paid. You can inspect inventory. Uh, you, you, but, but part of the substantive tests we have to talk about is the auditor attending stock takes. You look at the inventory and you see, does it look in a good condition or does it look rusty? Does it look old? Does it look it's been damaged by water or something of that type? You can examine new buildings. A client says, look, we have invested in this new building. Uh, why not go and see it? or we've invested in a new asset. Could I see that asset, please? Direct evidence obtained by the auditor by inspecting uh, tangible assets. Inspecting documents, uh, this uh, can also help us with 
uh, ensuring the controls have been operating properly. Uh, you get a batch of uh, timesheets and you ex inspect those documents uh, to make sure that any overtime that's been worked has the, 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 you know, the supervisor's signature next to it as authorization of the overtime. You look at purchase orders, copy purchase orders, and make sure that these copy purchase orders have got the signature of the, the company's buyer on it uh, and so on. And these are powerful controls uh, to make sure that people aren't simply paying themselves overtime or ordering goods which are not required by the company. Observation. <clears throat> Observing people doing stuff. Good example of this is, is very often more in controls and looking at substantive tests. But you have been told by the client when goods come in, what the people do in the receiving bay, where the goods are received. They count the goods, they inspect the goods, and they make sure that what they're receiving agrees with what was ordered. So you watch them doing it. Uh, you watch people maybe issuing goods from the stores and you make sure nobody will issue any sort of inventory from the stores unless they receive some sort of properly authorised requisition note. Uh, you watch people, let's say, go back to a jewellery shop. Uh, you, you watch people uh, and you know when you go to a jewellery shop there's usually a kind of glass kind of counter. These people are quite uh, well trained that they will take one item out at a time really and if you say, that's quite nice, but could I see that one? They will take this one and kind of put it back in very often. Uh, you're observing the kind of physical controls which are being exercised over the inventory. Of course, you have to be a little bit careful with observation. If people know they're being watched, they're going to be on their best behavior. They're going to be doing the right thing. So you almost have to kind of, kind of watch kind of, uh, you know, kind of, kind of slightly secretly. Uh, to, to, to make sure they're not changing their behavior. And then there is recalculation, reperformance. Why do we need to, to do that? Well, what you hope people will do regularly is a bank reconciliation. And you've all come across bank reconciliations. Uh, you have got the, the cash book balance. And then sometimes you update that for maybe bank charges or interest, which has not yet appeared on the uh, bank, uh, the, the cash book. Uh, and then you have the bank statement, and the, quite often there may be timing differences, uh, amounts which have been paid in, which haven't yet been credited, or checks which have been written for the payment of money out, which have not yet cleared through the system. So you've got a great list, usually, of timing differences. And then at the bottom here, you hope the two figures reconcile. Okay, the adjusted uh, cash balance and the adjusted bank statement balance. They should reconcile. But you cannot tell just by looking at that whether someone has done it correctly. What they might do is to simply make the two, two figures agree and then almost put in random amounts in, in between. Uh, uh, which bear no relationship to any sort of timing difference that might be there. So for for, for some, th or, or, or if you look maybe at uh, the calculation of wages, how do you know wages have been calculated correctly, the, the tax and the various other deductions? You, you, you can't just look at it and say, oh, that's right. You know, you have to sometimes go and get your, your hands dirty and re-perform and recalculate uh, uh, some of the some of the calculations. But these are the only things you can do. All of them uh, can be used uh, to provide evidence for substantive behaviour or substantive checks. Only these ones here will provide evidence of the operation of controls. Okay, we said analytical procedures was essentially ratios, or maybe comparing this year's to last year's figures. Uh, there's there's nothing in that which allows you to determine whether somebody is really properly authorizing invoices or timesheets uh, uh, or, or, or the, the like. You can, however, inquire if people are operating controls properly. I said not very good, maybe, but at least you can inquire. 
Uh, you can inspect documents for signatures and stamps and so on, evidence that they have been approved. You can observe people carrying out the controls. Uh, you can recalculate, for example, the bank reconciliations to ensure that the person who has been told to do a monthly bank reconciliation is actually doing it properly. Okay, what's meant by analytical uh, procedures? I've said it is ratios, I've said it is comparisons. Uh, the common uh, type of ratio analysis is to compare with previous years. You can also compare to budgets. You can also compare sometimes industry standards if you can get those. So what we're saying here is, for example, um, last year the gross profit percentage was 30%, this year it's 50%. Hmm. That's pretty good going. How is it possible for a company to just in a year increase gross profit percentage from 30% to this fantastic 50%? Uh, and what we're worried about here is that in fact it hasn't really increased by 50%, uh, that maybe it looks like 50% because there is a misstatement, there is an error. That's the problem. So this uh, uh, analytical procedures can of course be used at the planning stage. You you are presented with your financial statements, you do the ratios, so gosh that's very very different to last year. This looks like a high risk area. Of course the company might have worked a miracle and got it from 30% to 50%, but prima facie it's an area that you should be worried about. You can be looking also, uh, how does it fit in with our understanding of the entity? So if you had an entity which says all our cash, or nearly all our sales are cash, and you find now there's a substantial amount of receivables in it, there's a kind of a bit of a mismatch there in what you've been told and what you see. That's also a source of substantive testing. If last year the receivables collection period was 40 days and this year is about 39 days, you're not going to get that worried. Uh, if, however, last year it was 40 and this year it's 70, you think to yourself, how come it's increased? Uh, is it that these, it may be an error, uh, or it may be it's increased because these, these big, it's a big receivable there which is never going to be paid, uh, which, which is, which is going to be worrying. It could, of course, be innocent. It could be that we have deliberately increased the receivables period to be competitive. Ratio analysis is, is, is the common way of doing it, but you can also just compare to budgets. You know, so, so if uh, the budgeted sales were 1 million uh, and the actual sales were 750,000, is it that there has been a real shortfall of the 250,000? Uh, or is it that they have been misrecording sales? Is an error in there? So once you begin departing from the budget, people begin to get a little bit worried again. So this is used, remember, in three places, these analytical procedures. It's used initially uh, at the planning stage because big changes, big discrepancies arouse suspicion. It's used as a source of uh, substantive evidence. And then finally, just before we sign the audit report, we kind of sit back, we look at the, the figures compared to last year. Uh, we always maybe look at the ratios again and say, do I really believe in my heart of hearts uh, that the, the company really has increased gross profit from 30% to 50%? What we need to, to look at uh, here, uh, we need to, when we see um, a, a, a particular change in a ratio or a particular change in amount, we have to find the reason. We go to the finance director and we say, how come the collection period from customers has gone from 30 days to 70 days? And the finance director might say, well, the reason it's gone up is because we have far more export sales and the goods take several weeks to get to the customer and they're not going to pay before they get the goods uh, and therefore that has simply pushed up the, the collection period. What you must do then, once you've been given a reason, is you must test it because this reason is simply 
uh, inquiry, why has the collection period increased? And we know inquiry is a very weak form of evidence. You want to try and back that up uh, with some proper documentation, if you like. So what you could do is you could go and look at maybe the uh, sales analyses and you could say, well, last year, 90% of sales were in our own country, but I can see from the sales analysis that lots and lots of sales are now going abroad. So the story I've been told by the finance director is consistent with the evidence I'm seeing, the better evidence I'm seeing. You should never, ever believe anything you're told by anybody in a company. Now, get back to professional scepticism. This doesn't mean that you believe the people in the company when they tell you things are telling you lies deliberately. But remember, people are optimistic. People may themselves misunderstand the reason for certain figures. People might be pressed for time and they quickly give you an answer, a rather flippant answer, and they haven't thought about it correctly. Of course, sometimes people will give you a misleading answer deliberately. And we always need to be aware that that you know, everyone has these weaknesses, optimism, uh, misunderstanding, error, sometimes dishonesty. We need to think of the implications of this. And again, I'll come back to artifact in, in a moment. That's a slightly odd one out. It's in a way they're almost to make this uh, come out with ratio as you go, go down here. Implications. So if... Uh, if what the company tends to do is to give, let's say, a 5% discount for settling invoices within 30 days. That's common. Yeah. So give people what's called a settlement discount or a cash discount for quickly paying the amounts due. And if the average collection period goes from 30 days to 70 days, presumably we won't be giving many of our customers this discount. So what we should be seeing here is if the election period goes up, the discounts given to customers should go down. Okay, there's a direct implication there. Or if what we see uh, is that the borrowing has gone up, why is the borrowing gone up? Well, we needed to borrow because we were you're buying new machinery and so on, and you can see the new machinery has been been bought. If borrowing goes up, you expect interest to go up. So you, you want the, the things to hang together to make sense. And then maybe there is other effects. <coughs> if we go back to our, <coughs> excuse me, receivables days going up from 30 to se days to 70 days, the, the other effect is, hmm, will they pay? Because generally speaking, the longer people take to pay, the more risk you are that they will run into financial difficulties before they pay you. So we need to worry here about the um, the bad debts provision. Or if inventory is increased fantastically, uh, the implication might be if they double their inventory, uh, maybe what we have to do, well, where are they putting it? Have they had to rent another warehouse? But another effect would be if they've doubled their inventory, is it all going to sell? Or have they doubled their inventory by buying rubbish that nobody will want to buy? They've made actually a, a purchasing error. So, uh, the, the analytical procedures kind of give you an initial, uh, perhaps little, little kind of hint at a problem. And what you have to do is kind of scratch away at that to see whether or not the explanation you've been given is correct. Uh, uh, and whether or not there are any other kind of knock on effects, implications or other effects that we need to be worried about. Artifact put in here because, uh, as I say, to make it in a way, um, make the word ratio here, but it's really looking for uh, maybe a change in an amount can be almost accidental, easily explained. Uh, so so almost depending when your year end is can affect some figures. So if my year end one day, one year was the 31st of, obviously it's the 31st of December, let's say it's a Friday, uh, then you can be receiving cash from customers all the way up to the year end. If the next year, because of a leap year, if the next year, the year end, fell on a Sunday, uh, then you will not be receiving cash for the two last days of the financial period 
the Saturday and the Sunday, this would presumably mean that your receivables will be a little bit higher and your cash will be a little bit lower. So, so a pure, almost accident can explain it. Or one year, one large customer sends you the money on the 31st of December. The next year, that large customer sends you the money on the 3rd of January. It, it, it's almost a, a kind of artificial difference which you're getting. But you have to, you have to be aware of it. You have to say, well, that's easily explained. I, I didn't worry about the uh, receivables period increasing so much because it's really just an accident of this timing. You can be required to carry out simple analytical procedures. So the simple sort of things you'll be looking at, typically gross profit percentage, net profit percentage. Uh, you could look at expenses over sales to see whether those seem to be right. You look at receivables collection periods. Uh, you look at payables, payable periods there. You might uh, look at the days of inventory. These, these are the common ratios uh, to be looking at to see if everything seems to be pretty much as you expect or whether something seems to have gone off a bit and we need to look it at just a little bit more. So let's say we had uh, calculated uh, gross profit uh, percentage. Here we have a fall in gross profit percentage uh, from 30% in 2014 to 21% in 2015. And you might be asked to suggest reasons why this has fallen, uh, or you might be told that the finance director tells you a particular reason, and maybe you, you, you have to do some audit work in, in testing and verifying that explanation which has been given. There is no point if you see the gross profit percentage has fallen from 30% to 21%, saying it has fallen because the markup has fallen. They mean the same thing. Okay. There's not much point in either saying the gross profit percentage has fallen uh, because the selling prices have fallen. Uh, be, 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 because in a way, what, what you're doing is you're simply explaining the calculation, you know. So, so if gross profit percentage has fallen, the difference between cost price and selling prices has narrowed, you know, the selling price has fallen or the, the cost price has gone up. That What we want to know is why? Why would anyone in their right mind reduce the selling price? Or why would they buy goods at a higher price? And it could be that they've reduced selling price because the, the country's in recession or because the, uh, there has been a, a powerful competitor who's come in trying to gain market share the powerful competitor has reduced their market price, so we have to go and reduce ours. Why has the cost price gone up? Why has the cost gone up, but the selling price hasn't been pushed up as well? Well, well, maybe the, the cost's gone up, but the, the selling price has stayed low because we're in some sort of a long-term contract and we're being squeezed within that. Okay? So, so what we need to do is to try and kind of almost go one stage further. Gross profit percentage has fallen. Yes, that's because the, the margin has narrowed between costs and, and, and selling price. But why has that happened? No one would volunteer for that to happen. We want a good reason why that has happened. Similarly, if we look at the receivables collection period here, it's gone from 40 days to 54 days. And I've seen students giving answers saying the receivables collection period has gone from 40 days to 54 days because customers are paying more slowly. Yes, that's what it means. That is explaining nothing whatsoever about why it has gone from 50 days, uh, 40 days to 54 days. It could be that we have more export customers and that takes longer. It could be that we have deliberately extended the terms of credit to stay competitive. How we should be able to find evidence about that. We will look at the contracts or the, the terms in the bottom of the invoice and we'll say, you know, you know, 5% discount now for payment within 50 days uh, instead of payment maybe within 30 days. Uh, it could be because there is one large receivable balance, which has been a bit slow in being paid, which distorts the figure. 
But we, we need to, as I say, scratch down and see, okay, it has increased, but why has it increased? And of course, a, a reason we don't want to hear is it's increased because the company's credit control department, who should be following up the, the, the customers and phoning them up when they're not paying quickly enough, that, that that's not operating very well, that we've got a breakdown in the internal control relating to credit control. Uh, and this, of course, the implications you get from that is that people are taking longer to pay. Will they ever pay? Are we extending credit uh, to people who are high risk? And this could have implications because there therefore could be a material misstatement of the value of the receivables in the financial statements. So when we're looking for evidence, what do we need evidence about? And what we need evidence about are what is known as the assertions. When an amount appears on the financial statements, let's say it's the amount for plant and machinery in non-current assets, let's say 250,000, then that is making certain assertions, it's making certain proclamations. Uh, it is, for example, uh, saying uh, that it is accurate. Uh, that the, the, the material accurate, that there are no material errors in that figure. It is saying that it is complete, that we have included all the plant and machinery in that figure of 250,000. It is saying that there is cutoff. This is more to do with a, a profit and loss account item than a, than a, than a balance sheet item. Uh, but it's saying that sales or expenses for example, in 2017, are exactly the ones which appeared or were incurred in 2017. And we haven't brought in any or left any out from the, the adjacent years. It is saying that there's allocation. This is uh, uh, particularly to do with inventory. So when we're looking at manufactured inventory, we have uh, material, but also we have to put in allocate, if you like, some factory labor and some factory overheads, and we've got that done properly. Classification and presentation that the 250,000 of plant and machinery for non current assets, it is plant and machinery, it's in the right slot in the statement of financial position, and it's not vehicles, it's not uh, 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 premises, uh, land and buildings, and so on. And the presentation, uh, if we have to uh, make certain disclosures and presentations, for example, in the notes, maybe about the amount of depreciation, that has also been properly made. Occurrence, again, particularly to do with profit and loss account items that, for example, sales did actually occur, or maybe the addition of a non-current asset occurred. Valuation, uh, for non-current assets, we have to think about depreciation. We have to think about whether or not the, the item should be impaired and written down more quickly. Uh, valuation, very important also when you look at receivables. Should we make some allowance for not receiving amounts from uh, customers who may go into liquidation. Existence. It's all very well having 250,000 written on the statement of financial position against plant and machinery, uh, but does it actually still exist? Uh, it, it, it could have been destroyed, it could have been lost, it, it, it could have been stolen. Uh, but the presence of 250,000 is making this assertion or proclamation uh, that the uh, uh, items exist. And then rights and obligations. Do we own it? Or, or uh, we own it rather than renting it, for example. If it's land, we'd have to say whether it's freehold or leasehold land. And this is normally or often uh, remembered, uh, this list of assertions, by the mnemonic ACCA cover. Now, as we've been going down this, I've been saying that some of the assertions are particularly appropriate to maybe statement of financial position, uh, like existence, whereas some others are particularly appropriate uh, to profit and loss account, uh, for example, the uh, cutoff maybe, uh, or the occurrence. Uh, and the assertions are actually divided into two groups, one relating to, tra to transactions and events, which is essentially the profit and loss account items, and the other relating to account balances, which uh, re essentially relates to figures appearing on the statement of financial position. So here are the uh, income statement assertions really relating to transaction or events. 
uh, and uh, for example, sales expenses they occurred. We have them completely in there that we've made all the accruals that were necessary. Uh, accurate cut off that appear in 2017. We haven't brought in any uh, from the adjacent years. Uh, that they've been properly classified. For example, uh, that what is included as rent is rent. It isn't got some director's emoluments in there. Uh, heating and lighting is heating and lighting. It hasn't been messed up with maybe travel expenses. Uh, and finally, presentation, uh, where we have made disclosures which are required. When you look at the uh, balance sheet items, the statement uh, of financial position items here, we're looking at year end balances. So the asset exists, uh, it uh, writes over, we, we actually own it, uh, that we have uh, completely uh, included all of the, the assets, uh, that they're included accurately. For example, you'd expect cash to be absolutely accurate to the last cent. Uh, some other assets, uh, it's a bit more leeway perhaps in valuation when you're looking at inventory, maybe non-current assets, there's a little bit of a choice, I suppose, over the depreciation rate. Uh, and of course, the receivables, whether we have to write down some of the receivables. Allocation that we put the proper uh, amounts into the valuation of these figures. Classification, for example, uh, if we have a liability, it has to be classified either as a short term liability payable within 12 months or a long term liability payable further than 12 months away. And the, the figure is, by its very position in the statement of financial position, it is making a declaration, uh, an assertion that this has been properly described uh, and classified. And finally, presentation, making disclosures as required. So whenever you are asked to find evidence, let's say uh, uh, when we're auditing our uh, 250,000 of the non-current assets, we have to find evidence of every assertion. Uh, so we have to find evidence that the assets exist. So you go out and you would inspect some of them to see that they're still being used and it can still be found and so on. For rights and obligations, for some of them, you want to see documents of title, uh, which would prove that we still own the asset. Uh, for completeness, when you're looking at inventory, you should really look around maybe the, the, the back of the factory, uh, different areas of the factory to make sure we've included all of the inventory in the final stock take. Accuracy and valuation, uh, for example, in your non-current assets, you would re-perform, recalculate the depreciation calculations so that you had some assurance that the valuation was reasonable. Allocation in inventory, it would mean you'd have to go and examine the uh, overhead absorption rate, which was used to bring in some of these overheads into the work in progress and into the finished goods uh, so that we, we know that they were being properly dealt with. Classification, that something is plant and machinery, it's not vehicles, it's not land and buildings. We have to go and make sure uh, and, and gather some appropriate evidence, sufficient appropriate evidence uh, that the classification is correct. And finally, presentation. Uh, we need to know what the presentations should be. Uh, for example, the non-current assets, you would normally be uh, having to uh, disclose what the depreciation charge was and the, the depreciation provisions and so on. So people maybe have an idea of the, the age of these assets. And we have to have evidence that the presentation is correct. So these are the assertions. They are very, very important. The examiner will tend to say, you know, uh, explain maybe the assertions or four of the assertions may be uh, relevant to year-end balances. So you have to know what they, those are. You know they have to come from this list uh, and not this list. Uh, obviously, there's a little bit of uh, overlap within them, uh, but you, you must make sure that you address what the examiner wants properly uh, by giving the appropriate assertions for either year-end balances or for transactions and events. Uh, we will return to assertions in a later chapter.